are open all day long that you'll be able to jump in and out of. Uh, if you go to our schedule, which is uh, uh, nmu.edu, at Center for UP Studies, uh, and there's a schedule link there. You can go there and you'll see the links to all the sessions that will be going on. Uh, this room, we're in room one right now. Our next session will be starting as soon as our speakers arrive, uh, which will be two sides of faith. So we're just waiting for them. And when they get here, we will start the session. So uh, hang on uh, and we'll be starting in just a few minutes. Mm. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. To, it's good seeing you. Have a great weekend. You too. Enjoy this uh, typical fall weather. We will. <laughs> If you're joining us, we're just waiting for our uh, presenters to join this session. So we'll be with you in just a minute.
Again, we're just waiting for our speakers to join. Um, a few updates. Um, these sessions, we, um, if you're watching this session, uh, you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A button down at the very bottom of the uh, screen. You'll see Q&A, click on that. You can type in a question. Uh, we'll be doing a Q&A with the speakers um, at the end of each session. So the first 40 minutes or so will be of presenters. And uh, there, there's Russ. Um, the first 40 minutes will be presenters. And then uh, we will be going from there. So Russ is with us. Hello, Russ. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We're going to jump right into it. This uh, And uh, the, you're going to be the speaker first. But let me uh, just introduce the session and the speakers. And we'll wait for Eric to join us uh, probably while you're speaking. Uh, this session this morning is called Two Sides to Faith. Uh, and really looking at different perspectives on, uh, in particular, on the Catholic Church in the Upper Peninsula and Upper Great Lakes. We have two speakers today, Dr. Russell Minyagi, a Professor Emeritus of History from NMU, and Eric Hemingway, who's Director of Archives and Records for the Little Traverse Band of Ottawa Indians. Um, Russ hardly needs an introduction since he's the one who started this whole thing years ago. Um, but if you don't know who Russ is, I'm just going to give you a short biography that he is an award-winning historian of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, an author of over a dozen books on the Upper Peninsula, and I think it's probably more than that now. Um, and he is a graduate of the University of San Francisco and St. Louis University, and taught history for 45 years at Northern Michigan University, including myself, was one of his students. And he and his wife, Dan, live here in Marquette. And so we're going to kick it off with Russ. Russ, you got uh, 20 minutes. Tell us all uh, you know about Bishop Frederick Berga, the man, his legacy in the house. Okay, thank you, Dan. And I just like to say you've done a very good job during this uh, uh, Corona uh, Corona problem that we're uh, we're having. Well done. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little about uh, uh, Father Bishop Frederick Berga. Uh, this is a book, this is a picture of him, uh, so you kind of have an idea of who we're talking about, and uh, also uh, this is interesting, this is a picture of him after his years of uh, missionary work throughout the Great Lakes area, uh, very tanned, and some people said he had taken on the appearance of a Native American. I developed this, uh, this book and thus the, the topic in uh, recent years, and I gathered material that uh, was uh, barely known. It's a uh, biography that his good friend and uh, fellow Slovene, uh, Father uh, uh, Edward, uh, Edward Yocker, uh, presented to a packed cathedral at the end of January, 1868. I don't know how the people, uh, many people came from out of town. I don't know how they got here except either snowshoe or sleds. And uh, it, had been, uh, it had been pretty much lost. It was uh, published in the Marquette Weekly Plain Dealer. And I wanted to get that into print so people could, uh, could read uh, uh, these insights by a fellow that uh, knew him quite uh, quite well. And then I also found as I was doing the, the work that uh, people made comments that he was a very gentlemanly individual and uh, he serviced not only, he not only ministered to, uh, to Catholics, to Native Americans, uh, but also to uh, Protestant, Protestant communities. And uh, many of these uh, legacy items uh, had really never been gotten gotten into, and I, I pulled those together. And then the last part of the, uh, the study was a history of the house, which is located at the end of South Fourth Street and is open to the public. Though check with hours, I think uh, with the uh, with the virus, uh, they they're either closed or limited. But when things uh, get back to normal or new normal, uh, you'll be able to visit it. I guess one of one of the questions that comes up is uh, 
what was the the introduction what happened with the introduction of christianity and just very very briefly uh you find that uh, christianity uh for instance entered europe and um entered for instance the world of of uh, uh father baraga uh the slovenes uh around the year a thousand and um it went into Europe and changed uh, changed the Europeans uh, radically in terms of uh, their religions, which had been uh, had been pagan religions in the past. Uh, and uh, when people try to reconstruct those uh, ancient religions and cultures and so on, they have to rely on legends, study of place names. Um, and references that might be made to the uh, to the culture. So uh, the introduction of Christianity then had an impact on uh, Europe, uh, uh, beginning say in the year four hundred, and then continuing uh, through say the year a thousand. Now um, Bishop Baraga was born. We'll, we'll talk about him and then uh, why he came to the Great Lakes and ministered. Uh, he was born in Slovenia in 1797 and uh, trained at the University of uh, Vienna and was ordained a priest in the Catholic Church in 1823. Now the question is when you talk about uh, missionary work and uh, the question comes up, why? Why did uh, missionary work take place? And it centers around what is called the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is in Matthew 28, uh, verses 16 through 20. And to sum it up, basically uh, the, you might say founder, leader of Christianity, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, directed his disciples, apostles, uh, that they should go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded, and I am always with you to the end of the age, paraphrased. And so that's where uh, the, the missionaries, uh, they're given the, all of the missionary work then uh, for Christians is centered around this uh, uh, great commission that is given to uh, the apostles, disciples, and so on to spread Christianity. That's where they're coming from. Now, Baraga then comes from a wealthy family, could have stayed in Europe, enjoyed upper-class life. He had studied to be a lawyer. He was a, an, an artist as well, but he decided to uh, come to the uh, come to the new world, uh, where he arrived in December thirty first, eighteen thirty, and <clears throat> planned to uh, uh, spread Christianity, as he said, in this little cultivated part of the Lord's uh, the Lord's vineyard. Uh, so it's the Great Commission, and then the um, uh, his actual arrival. Um, Moving along here, he's going to uh, work first work with the uh, Adawa people at Cross Village in northwestern Michigan, where he arrives in 18 May of 1831. Uh, one of the things about uh, about Baraga is that he devotes his entire life to the missionary work, lived in poor structures, uh, leaking roofs. Uh, but he was uh, always very concerned about uh, the native people. And uh, one of the first things he did was to learn uh, the, the language, the Anishinaabe or Chippewa, Ojibwe, and the Adawa, which both languages are, are very close in terms of their, uh, uh, their uh, learning and using them and so on. And um, uh, he's going to spend his his life. He could have stayed, as I said, he could have stayed in Europe, Europe and and done well, but he decides to uh, to come to the New World, and uh, he followed the other thing that that he did. He followed uh, native custom um, in terms of dealing with elders, dealing with leaders of a village, and would ask them if it was uh, proper for him to come and to. Uh, uh, convert 
and and uh, basically what would happen is change of people. But I think he also saw, and, and you see this uh, frequently, he saw that the uh, Native American was not going to be, uh, was not going to be um, left alone. And that even the, at the time that he arrived, he could see that a lot of the Indian culture had changed. And so you had the, the larger white American or Euro-American um, world uh, invading the world of the, of the Native American. And so his concern, uh, we'll see his concern is to uh, help the Native American to enter that, uh, enter that new world. Uh, for instance, one of the things that he saw as a uh, terrible uh, plague uh, against the Indians was the use of uh, alcohol, alcohol, alcoholic spirits. Uh, this had been done by the, by the French, by the English, by the Americans. And um, he, he was totally against uh, alcohol, drinking, would have people take, as happened at the time, uh, pledges uh, not, to, uh, not to drink. So he tried to, did his best to stop the use of alcohol. The other thing that he's going to do in terms of the Native Americans is to protect them from uh, the government at one point uh, relocating them out on the plains. Uh, he bought property and gave it to the Indians, had, it, had it, the, the title changed so that the Indians own the land or they were on his land and they couldn't be, they couldn't be removed because the government had come in and say, uh, we're going to remove you, we're going to bring you to new uh, federal lands and the Native Americans couldn't do anything about it. Now, if they had land and they were, uh, or through Barga had the land, uh, they couldn't be removed. The other thing that he did was he immersed himself in Indian culture. Uh, he learned the languages. He uh, printed an Adawa prayer and hymn book, uh, the first in the, in the language. Uh, he had other catechisms, uh, books of uh, questions and answers on religions. Uh, he, 1850 uh, published the theoretical and practical grammar uh, of the Ojibwe language. Uh, a few years later, he published the dictionary of the language. Um, people point out that, uh, the, and the dictionary has been questioned, is, is it accurate, etc. cetera, uh, still published. And it was, uh, it sort of froze the language in 1853 when it, when it was published. And he also published many uh, books um, dealing with uh, native life and so on. So he was very concerned about uh, saving and uh, saving the, uh, the native uh, culture and the native life when, when he could, uh, but affecting the introduction of Christianity. Catholicism in particular. And it's pointed out that uh, the, uh, they would have ceremonies, and here, here you get into the, the friction with the native culture, where the, he and other missionaries and the, uh, uh, the converts would destroy as superstitious uh, medicine bags uh, that uh, they had uh, from, their, from their ancient culture. And the, the other thing to, to highlight about, about Baraga is uh, that he left, led a very humble life. I, I don't know how he survived because he was a vegetarian, uh, only ate fish and bread, uh, no salt, since he considered that a, an extravagance, and uh, traveled on, the other thing is that he traveled, as we're, we're familiar, he traveled on snowshoes, uh, an indigenous uh, item, uh, traveled on snowshoes in the winter and canoes in the, in the, the summertime. At, for instance, at Lance, where he first arrived in 1842, uh, was where he picked up uh, land for the Native Americans, uh, built uh, 24 uh, comfortable log houses uh, for the people, uh, then got them into uh, farming and they eventually became potato farmers. And when the mining frontier developed, uh, the Native Americans sold uh, potatoes to the miners. 
uh, and this came locally, so it wasn't as expensive as importing importing things. But once again, he wanted to prepare the uh, prepare the Native Americans for the coming uh, white uh, uh, frontier. Um, as I said, he used the sparse funds he had to uh, help Native Americans. Uh, for instance, when he uh, took a trip to uh, Europe, uh, the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Empire Franz, uh, Franz Joseph I, gave him a jeweled cross and a fancy uh, bejeweled Episcopal ring when he was bishop. And uh, Baraga, when he came back to the United States, sold the, uh, the cross and the ring and used the money for the, uh, for the missions. Um, uh, the other thing about, uh, about Baraka was that he worked with incoming um, immigrants that settled on the mining frontier. Uh, he was fluent in his native Slovenian language, in German, the official language of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, French, uh, because when he went to school, the French had occupied Slovenia, and he knew Latin and Greek, picked up some Italian, and then knew uh, the native languages, uh, Adawa and uh, Anishinaabe. And so he was able to uh, minister to the French Canadians, Germans, Americans, and Irish. Oh, and he, obviously he also knew, uh, he also knew English. Uh, 1853, he became a uh, bishop of the Diocese of uh, Sault Ste. Marie Marquette and uh, died in January of 1868. Uh, as I said, in the <clears throat> last years, uh, this is uh, the image of Baraga uh, having spent uh, decades on the, on the Lake Superior frontier. The, um, the legacy of, um, uh, the legacy of uh, Father Baraga is, and I won't have time to go into a lot of details. You can, if you want, you can pick up the details in my, uh, in my book, which is available at bookstores around town. But you're going to find that, for instance, uh, the Methodist missionary, John Peitzel, who was at Lance, uh, who had a reputation of not being too happy with Catholics, uh, was kind of hostile towards them, uh, saw Baraga as a uh, gentleman and uh, just a wonderful individual. And Baraga, in response, uh, when, the, uh, when the Methodist mission needed a bell, he had an extra one, uh, he gave them a bell to call uh, uh, congregants to, uh, to service and so on. And you find uh, government officials uh, that, uh, that viewed, uh, viewed Baraga, uh, saw him again as a as a gentleman and as a person that was, uh, as one fellow, uh, Richard Morris said, he walks apart from the selfish and sensual, uh, sensual world. Uh, may he not infuse, uh, uh, may he not infuse life-giving uh, balm into the heart of the enthralled uh, uh, Chippewa. He even calls him at that time sainted Bishop, uh, Bishop Baraga. Uh, he was outside of the religious sphere. He was made in 1855 an honorary member of the Superior Historical Society. A few years later, a similar thing happened with the Historical Society of uh, of Michigan. Uh, there's a very interesting story of uh, a rather rough uh, ship captain, uh, John McKay. And uh, when Baraga had suffered strokes and was, was, uh, had found it difficult because tremors and so on uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, eat food and, and hold a spoon, uh, the captain, who was, as I said, very rough, went and came in and uh, uh, held his head and served him food on the, on the ship. Uh, you find newspaper articles uh, popping up in Michigan and Wisconsin and so on, uh, praising him and his work and what he did. Um, uh, Charles Cabagam, we have a, a biography coming out uh, in, a, in a few days about him. Um, uh, not mine, but uh, uh, Tyler's. Um, he was a member of Kabagam, 
uh, was a, never spoke English and uh, was a member of uh, St. Peter Cathedral and thus uh, interacted with, uh, with Barrett. Um, uh, so th there was a tremendous outpouring. You find that uh, Peter White, uh, whose life Baraga saved uh, with the help of Native Americans and so on a number of occasions, um, uh, was good friends with, um, was good friends with, with Baraga and saw to it that uh, Superior Street uh, was renamed around 1903 as uh, Baraga Avenue, which it, it still is today. Uh, and I could go into uh, details of the many things that are named after Barraga, uh, streets, townships, county, counties, towns, uh, uh, both in, in Michigan and, uh, uh, and Wisconsin. Uh, again, uh, we don't have, have time for that. Um, finally, the, the Barraga House, I uh, just make comment about that. The Barraga House was built in 1857. Uh, and it was um, built by a relative, he can fill us in exactly, but it was built by a relative of Dan Truckee. Uh, and uh, it's the oldest house in, um, in Marquette. It's at the end of, of, third, of Fourth Street. And as I said, if you look at the house today, it's uh, covered with brick. Uh, but originally it was a very, a very plain house. I'll put a picture of uh, the house up for you. Uh, so you have an idea of what it looked like uh, originally and it's been added to over the years. Um, so anyway, this kind of gives you an, an overview of probably the most prominent, uh, prominent uh, missionary, and, but also historical figure in the development of the, uh, of the Upper Peninsula. And so with that, I end my, end my presentation. I don't know if, if we have quite a, uh, how we're gonna do the questions, uh, if there are any. So if anybody has any questions, uh, the way to do that is they can type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We currently don't have any, but I will, uh, and we are waiting for Eric Hemingway to join. Eric is having internet issues down in Harbor Springs, so we hope that he'll be able to join uh, with enough time to present before 9.30. We might not have time for to do a Q&A with him, uh, but we'll stay on and see if he can join us. But I uh, just to address what Russ had said about uh, uh, Nelson Bergeron, um, or Basha, as he became known and the family became known in Marquette as the Bashas. And a lot of people wonder, okay, so why, why are Bergeron's Bashas? Well, Nelson Bergeron and, and most French Canadians would not have pronounced his name Bergeron. He would have pronounced it Bergeron uh, in a very clipped way. Uh, and so often when dealing with uh, English census takers, but uh, bureaucrats uh, and and he was not a person. Most uh, French Canadians who came here were not literate people. They could not even write their own name. And so in legal documents and in, in, uh, in work, he would go by this corruption of his name, which became Basha. Nelson came here, I believe in 1850, one of the first French Canadian settlers in uh, Marquette uh, with his wife Flavia. They came actually from Ticonderoga um, they were based in the fort there. I think his family had moved there when he was a child. Uh, his family originally were Acadians. Um, and many Acadians, of course, went down to, um, um, to Louisiana, became Cajuns. And there's a lot of Bergerons down in, uh, in that part of the world. Um, but some went to other places. And his family ended up in upstate New York uh, in Ticonderoga area. And... Um, and eventually he came here probably looking for work and found out that there was work to be done. He was a carpenter and, um, and uh, worked at Amos Harwell's uh, sawmill as well, which is where he bought the lumber to build uh, the Barraga house. Um, it was not of course the Barraga house when it was built. Uh, Bishop Barraga wasn't in the area yet. It was built to be the first Catholic church in Marquette and also to serve as the home of the, uh, the priest. Uh, and so uh, it was built to be a very, um, 
a, a dual use facility, if you will, um, and later on was changed into a, a formal chapel. Uh, but then when the cathedral was built right next to it, and it, right where the cathedral stands today in Marquette, uh, it became uh, the rectory, if you will, um, and had a chapel in it, but it was really the rectory for the church. And Russ has a picture right there of after. You could see they had added a chapel to the back of the building itself. Um, and, uh, but that of course uh, was removed when they moved it originally right across the street, it was moved. Um, and then it was moved to where its current location at the end of uh, uh, 4th Street in South Marquette um, and, uh, and a brick exterior was put on it. Um, and uh, I do wanna say that though COVID has changed this, um, they are open to the public. Um, the Bishop Berga Association, Historical Association, wants people to understand that it is not simply a place for Catholics or for people who are members, but it is open to the public. Um, with COVID, I do not believe they have open hours, but once things have returned to some normalcy, you should be able to go and visit to see uh, their, uh, they have turned it into a museum, the first floor, and there uh, are some displays uh, to see. Um, and, and actually also the rooms where they believed uh, Berga lived and passed away. And uh, they've interpreted the space. So it, it's really fascinating and interesting uh, for me to go in there. Of course, it is really, uh, really neat just to think that my great, great, great grandfather, Nelson Bergeron, uh, built that home. Um, and, uh, um, but, but also too, that it had such an important historical uh, connection with the community and the Catholic church here in Marquette. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, just... Eric will join at 930. That's, that's, that won't work, um, but <laughs> I just got an email from him. Uh, uh, that won't be, he won't be able to present at 930. But anyway. Um, Dan, do you, Dan, do you want me to add? Yeah, go to that, Russ. Add things. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I was going through it. I was a little late there and I was going through it very fast. So I, I kind of left some some items out. Uh, one of the questions that, that comes up is how do uh, uh, Native Americans today view Barica? And you get kind of a mixed bag. Uh, some uh, positive, some negative. Uh, but I, want, I have one fellow, Danny Garso from uh, Ishpeming, uh, Lake Superior in Ishnabi. Uh, his name is, um, uh, let's see, Wabi uh, Juzi Mai Ingan, which means he's a gray wolf. And uh, his family, uh, uh, his ancestors were married by uh, Father Barraga on Madeline Island over at La Pointe, Ashland, Wisconsin. And so he has this uh, personal uh, connection uh, through his family with, uh, with Father Barraga, Bishop Barraga and so on. And uh, he said in, a, in, in the book, I have his, his statement, he said, many of my friends lost trust with the church and, the, and bear hard feelings because of historic European lack of respect for indigenous culture, language, and people. Horrible things were done to the indigenous people in the name of progress, civilization, and the church. I believe Baraga was much different. Baraga learned the language, observed the culture, and truly saw the full relationship of the Anishinaabe Beg uh, have with God, Gichi, uh, Gichi Manit Manitou, the Great Spirit. Uh, he saw that the Anishinaabe Beg already believed in God and were not savages. Uh, he was able to bring the Catholic Church teachings to, to the Anishinaabe Beg while still respecting them as people, uh, respecting their language and respecting their culture. Uh, he cared, cared about them and valued them as human beings. He often gave himself and his possessions uh, to aid the Anishinaabe Beg people, which included legal lobbying, the deeding of property, enabling them to remain in their homeland when so many other indigenous people were forced to move. He's a living example of Jesus and I believe brought many Ojibwe to the church through personal exemplar. And that's kind of, that kind of uh, ties in what I was saying, how he was viewed by many people as a gentleman uh, in terms of dealing with people, uh, either native people 
uh, or others. Thanks, Russ. Um, if you want to speak any further, I'm just trying to connect to Eric right okay. now. Okay. Uh, some of the, I, I just br briefly mentioned the legacy, uh, but in 1875, for instance, Barraga County was created and named after him. Uh, 1921 Barraga State Park, though it's the smallest park in the in the Michigan system, was uh, created. As I said, Superior Street in Marquette was renamed uh, Barraga Avenue. Uh, for many years, there was Bishop Barraga High School in Marquette, uh, 1903 to 69. Uh, there are also uh, Bishop Barraga Catholic schools in uh, Iron Mountain and Sheboygan. Uh, there's the, there are monuments honoring him. One is a uh, wooden cross that is, is uh, now a, 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 granite, a granite cross in uh, Minnesota, uh, uh, where he landed having crossed the, crossed the lake. 1972, the uh, Shrine of the Snowshoe Priest, the large statue up at, uh, at Lance, a uh, 60-foot tall statue was dedicated. Um, you have a in um, down in in uh, Grand Rapids. There is a statue where where he served uh, uh, that was uh, was put up in 2012. Thanks, uh, Russ. Now Eric has joined us. Yay! So I'm going to turn over to Eric Hemingway, um, and we've got 20 minutes for him to do his presentation, and then we're going to have to switch to the next session. Eric is the director of archives and records. But the Little Traverse Bay, a band of Odawa Indians, Eric works to collect and preserve historical materials for the tribe. These materials are used to support the, the band and tribal government to create historical and educational materials such as exhibits, signs, presentations, and lesson plans. He has worked on numerous repatriations with NAGPRA uh, and is former board member of the NAGPRA Review Committee, the Michigan Humanities Council, and the Michigan Historical Society, and he is on the Michigan Historical Commission. So, Eric, thanks for joining us. And that's all well, your, your next Thank quarter. you. I'm sorry for the, the grappling with technology this morning. And Understood. We, we figured it out. So I want to say thanks for having the opportunity to come here today and share a little bit about the history and the perspective of the, the Catholicism and Christians within the tribal community. And I always put the disclaimer that, you know, what I present is just one view of many views and well, that it's a very world, complicated you know, and ongoing relationship, the but the influence and um, repercussions of the of contact with Christians and particularly Catholics for our community is still very prevalent to this day. And some of the very first uh, Europeans to make contact with the Odawa were the Jesuits in the 1600s and they were traveling with French traders and explorers sure. and the earliest records we so have we, of, um, from Europeans are from the Jesuits. So I, I'm always going back to the, what we call the Jesuit relations to see some of the written record uh, pertaining to, to our tribe, the Odawa and the Great Lakes. But it's a, it's a tumultuous history. It's a tumultuous relationship of change and influence. And it just, it started out with, you know, these priests coming into our our communities traveling and trading, uh, watching, observing, commenting. And the Odawa at first were tolerant um, because of the possibilities of trade with the French and not many Odawas converted upon contact. And from my per historical perspective that these relationships were based on political and economics, that having uh, priests around in your communities was helpful when, you, when it came to trade, when it came to having relationships with the French and that they went with the Odawa on all many of their excursions. Um, but some did convert wholesale, you know, they, I'm not going to say that they didn't, but they did convert to Catholicism and they changed their, their religious beliefs. And, you know, there's the, the very famous story of when Marquette was transferred from where he passed to St. Ignace that the Odawa were the ones who transferred his, his remains and interred him at St. Ignace. So the, there's definitely some staunch followers in, that they would do things like this um, to go above and beyond. But many Odawa were reluctant to, to convert. They were reluctant to change their way of life. And for centuries, that's what they 
did, they didn't change. But as time wore on and that the Odell had less opportunity to govern themselves due to changing regimes within North America from French, British to American. And finally with the Americans, the, the reality was that the Odawa didn't have the, the religious freedom that others were enjoying in this country. And it wouldn't be until 1978 that all native people would have the, oppor would have the opportunity to practice a religion openly with the Indian Religious Freedom Act. So many, well, not many, all native religions were outlawed, they were demonized, they were list, you know, listed as taboo, um, and they were banned under federal law and also by society. They just weren't accepted. And this was later in the 1800s and all through the 20th century. So the Odawa were part of this. They had you know, total religious freedom upon contact and slowly that religious freedom was chipped away at, it was eroded until it was utterly, not impossible, but it was utterly illegal. And, but the Odawa still would you know, hold their ceremonies and practice in secret once they realized that they couldn't do this in the open. And we had what we have um, a very unique situation here at Little Travers and that we had an Indian boarding school in our community up until 1983. And that was the last government sponsored Indian boarding school to close in the country. And that was in Harbor Springs, the Holy Childhood of Jesus boarding school. And that was run by the Catholics. So I live in Harbor Springs now, and that was one of the defining um, landmarks within our town is the boarding school. It's the biggest building in, in the whole town, a large red brick building, and in, it was right next to the church. And that was torn down, I believe, in 2007. But hundreds, if not thousands, of Odawa children went through this school, and, and many schools across the country. The Indian boarding schools wasn't just for Harbor Springs. It was a system of forced assimilation for all Native people in North America and Canada, they had what they called residential schools. And different denominations would sometimes uh, administer the schools, whether it's Catholic or Methodist. And sometimes the schools were just, just pure government schools like down in Mount Pleasant, the industrial school. But we had the Catholic school here in Little Traverse. So it's a very, like I said, tumultuous timeline between contact with the French and we made first contact in 1615, and then for over two and a half centuries, you see this influence start to gain, and it just came to the point where they were controlling this institution of forced assimilation within our own community. And before the boarding school was established in the late 1880s, after the War of 1812, the, the Odawa knew that they, did, they couldn't take up arms to combat the change that was occurring in their communities. Uh, that we fought the Americans three times in battle, the Revolutionary War, Little Turtles War, or the Old Northwest War, and then the War of 1812. And that was to protect our rights and our lands. But after the War of 1812, we knew that we couldn't pick up the, the, the term is pick up the hatchet, and we had to resort to diplomacy and other means to stay in our lands because we were targeted, like many other tribes, for removal to Kansas and Oklahoma in the 1830s. So hundreds of thousands of natives are being removed to Oklahoma and Kansas, and the, the Odawa here is, that was not an option to leave home. We had to stay home. And one of the strategies was to start to embrace the idea of quote unquote, being civilized in the eyes of the Americans because civilized Indians don't get removed as easily. And so leaders like Mukmanish, or excuse me, Asiganak and his brother Apuxigan, they were the two of the main leaders at Little Travers up here in Northern Michigan for the Odawa. They started to embrace the idea of Catholicism and they welcomed priests in and they started to help build churches and this caused a great deal of strife within our community because when these early priests came in such as Dijon and Baraga, they, they were pretty hard line in their stance towards traditional beliefs and customs. And in one instance, in 1829 and 1830, um, Dijon and then Baraga would hold large bonfires down at Holy Childhood, down at Holy Springs, and they would demand that you know, any Odawa who was serious about converting to Catholicism burn all their sacred items. So their pipes, their feathers, their drums, things they've been using for thousands of years, um, he demanded, both of them demanded to be burned, and some did. Some went down and they actually burned their items. So it was a very 
tense time and some of Taoists refused to do this. They refused to destroy their sacred items and it caused a bit of a schism within our community and the traditional and the uh, Catholic separated for a short time and the Catholic Odawas came and established what we know today as Harbor Springs. So if you come to Harbor Springs and you see these signs in town, it says established 1829, um, that's when a Siganak and his band decided that this, we're gonna make this our, our settlement, our, our place to you know, worship essentially. But within a few years, the tribe got back together and realized that there was more pressing things that they had to confront besides religion and, and beliefs, and that was removal. That the United States was looking to force them out of their land, so they all came back together and, and you know, tackled that obstacle head on and um, essentially yes. won, we're still here. But part of the part of the plan was to, you know, invite more of the, the Catholics and have more of a presence. And the, you start to see more of these churches go up in our communities in Cross Village, Middle Village, um, Harbor Springs, Beaver Island, High Island, Charlevoix, Petoskey. And some of these churches are still here and some of them aren't. They just didn't withstand the test of time, but some of them are. And but this influence is on a whole nother level with our community because of the boarding school and with having that boarding school in, in our essentially backyard and so late, um, it's had huge repercussions for our community. Um, people often ask me, why don't you speak your language fluently? You have a, a few words that you say, and you know, I have to be honest and tell it's taken out of my community for over a hundred years. And that's why, you know, a large reason I don't speak my language fluently because it was taken out of my community at the boarding school. And a lot of kids who went to the boarding school never made it back. A lot of them passed that boarding school. So families were being fractured. And the experiences varied um, very widely from child to child, from person to person. Some people I talked to had good experiences at the school, then some had devastating experiences. So it's a very complicated uh, topic to talk about. I often feel uncomfortable to talk. I didn't go to a boarding school and there's still many survivors of the boarding school within our community and across North America. So I, I tread lightly on this topic because of the sensitivity of it, but it is without a doubt um, made an impression and made an influence um, on our community. And the school, like I said, was torn down in 2007. There was great debate over to keep it up or tear it down. Um, I was at that. Uh, they had one of the last viewings of the school people could go in and do a little walk through the school before it got torn down and it was a very very powerful moment there was people saying take it down because it reminds me of what happened it brings the pain back and and then some people said no keep it up because it will remind people that this happened that you know this institution of forced assimilation was was real and we have to remind people of the trauma that occurred so there was debates and I agreed with both sides. It was, I couldn't say one or the other, but also I, I didn't attend. So I just listened and heard the stories. And in the end, the, the school was torn down. And today, if you go downtown Harbor Springs, you, you wouldn't know that the school was there. There's no marker, there's no signs, the building's gone, but the legacy is definitely you know, very strong within the community. A lot of people went to that school that I know personally and they tell me these stories of what happened, the good and bad. So that's very, very unique to little Traverse Bay bands without Indians, but across the country, you know, they, they all had their different experiences. And, but it makes me think as a historian, the timeline of this, when the first contact in the 1600s, all the way to the boarding school, this is, you know, two and a half centuries of interaction. And it's interesting to see the, the twists and turns in some of this and the early Jesuits and the early priests of the French would come here and in the records, the Odao would often ask, you know, how come you don't, you travel alone and you come here and you, you have odd habits, they would say, you have odd habits that when people are dying, you always want to be around them, you know, trying to administer the last rites. And they, have, they thought it very odd that um, they didn't have a wife and no kids. They were just alone in these really harsh conditions. So they were they were observing the priest as well, and as well as the priest observing us. So there was this these two populations, you know, observing each other and coexisting for some time. And then there was strife. There was war, the French and Indian War, Pontiac's War, and these things would just blow up. But then the priest would always be around trying to mediate and trying to moderate a lot of these conflicts. But a lot of times it was just 
just out of their league. It was out of their grasp to even try to influence because these were nations fighting nations for, for land resources and for control, but they were there. And like I mentioned in the beginning, I would often go to the Jesuit relations for some of the early pieces of information. I always have to remind myself though, that this is through their lens and it's, it's very, um, it's very racist. It's very derogatory, you know, constantly being called a savage and a heathen and a barbarian. Uh, it took me some time to learn how to train myself as a historian to read these things without just getting all angry and stopping and shutting down. And uh, my mentor said, no, you have to read it, but read it through their lens and not get so attached. You just have to detach and read it and start taking the information out of it. Like, what were they eating? Where were they at? What were they doing? And just try to not shut down, which it took some time. It was, it was very difficult. And I still get a little riled up reading those, you know, and the, the word savage and, and heathen really, really uh, pushed the button for me. We're not savages and we're not heathens. You know, we have a very strong system of beliefs. It's just very different than other people's. And those systems or beliefs are, are coming back. And there's a big change within our community to, you know, embrace the old ways, the traditional ways. Uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of my friends when they name their children, they're naming them in Odawa names. That's, not, that's what's on their birth certificate. Zongade, Nude Win, Nagana Gijik. And that, wouldn't, that wasn't occurring 100 years ago. You know, they were strictly taking a lot of names from the Bible. And that was the names that they were using that were accepted socially. But now we're seeing it shift back to our old names. And it's really encouraging. People are starting to learn the language and going to ceremonies and trying to pick up where our ancestors, you know, pick up the pieces our ancestors left us. So that's, that's happening as we speak. But as I always tell people that we're piecing things back together, it was, it was taken apart systematically and with, with purpose. And it's very hard to look back as a historian and realize that, that a population came in and deemed your, your beliefs and your way of life, um, heathenism, demonic, devil worship, and the best thing for you as a human is to abandon that and embrace this new way to save your soul. And to me, that, that, that doesn't click. It doesn't work for me. But that's what was being put upon us as a population by another population. And if anything, the Odawa are very resilient. And they, they went along to a certain degree, but they always retained their, their traditions. And this time of year, we have what we call ghost suppers. And the ghost supper is also called the Feast of the Dead. And this is one of the oldest traditions for the tribe and that the communities get together, the families, and they hold a community supper at their home. Uh, traditionally, they would have the supper, the feast at the graves, but it's, it's shifted over time, they had to. But today we have suppers that are open to the community and we feed our ancestors. Now with COVID going on, everybody that I talk to is just doing a very personal supper family, but normally, the families open up their homes. Anybody can come. There's no invite. You hear about it, you're invited. And we have a sacred fire that we feed the ancestors with. And everybody who comes and eats feeds their ancestors. And then they leave and go. And sometimes we have two or three suppers in one night. And it's very social. It, it keeps the, the community intact. And this is one of their oldest traditions. And it was observed by the Jesuits upon first contact that the Odawa would have these massive feasts for days to honor their dead at Mackinac. And so this is an old tradition and it was under attack when the, the priest came into our villages saying, you have to stop doing this. And the Odawa got very clever and they moved the ghost supper to uh, November 1st, All Souls Day. And the priest would come back and say, oh, okay, you're, you're, you're getting it now. You're, you're really starting to see the way, but really they were just hiding out in the open with their traditions. So that's a little bit about the Odawa and the experiences with us and the, the church, it's still ongoing. And we have, like I said, we have many Catholics in our community to this very day. And part of my job as uh, director of archives, I have a unique uh, task and I go around and clean up the cemeteries, uh, mow grass, uh, move debris and take limbs away from crosses. I replace crosses, paint crosses. So I spend a lot of time in cemeteries and it's, I don't see it as Catholic, Presbyterian, or one way or the other. It's just, a, it's the burial ground of the ancestors. And I often, you know, replace crosses um, on 
burials. And I had one of our communities member ask us, you know, how do you know that they were Catholic? You know, how do you know they just, they get a cross? And I was like, well, it's, I don't know that, but they had a cross before I came along and I'm going to replace that. And I also, it's a recognized burial marker. You know, people see crosses, they know somebody's buried there. And I also say, well, maybe they just use it as something where the people can come and put a wreath and a wreath is a, something that's done this time of year as well as we make uh, their, their circles usually out of red willow and we tie red willow into a circle and we we put paper mache flowers on that circle it's called a wreath or a crown and we place these crowns or wreaths on the graves of our ancestors and a lot of times people just want to cross so they can put a wreath on their ancestors their family's grave so me and my mom just got done doing this the other day for my my family we put um, wreaths and new crosses um, on their on their burials and they're not Catholic, um, but we use those just to show that somebody is here. So I know my time is about up, so I'll, I'll switch over and see if we have a time for a few questions. Well, we, we, we don't have enough time for questions. What I'm going to ask people to do, Eric, is contact you directly. Sure. Um, they could go to the, uh, the website for the Little, little Traverse Band, Bay uh, Ad Adawa Indians, and you can be located there and they can email you questions uh, or, or uh, text you, your phone number is there. I wish we had time, but it is time to move on to our next session. I am so glad though, that we got to have you be a part of this. I, uh, I was like, oh man, I hope we can get Eric, Eric here. And, uh, and I, I just love your perspective and, and in looking at both Russ's talk about Bishop Barriga um, and yours, it really gives a fuller picture of uh, you know the role that Catholicism played and Christianity played in uh, uh, in both our societies, especially early on, and um, and how now we're we're finally, I think we're finally addressing these things, and I think that's really really important um, uh, as we move forward is uh, inclusive ideas, and uh, so that we can we can all move forward together. I mean that's the plan, right? That's the plan and I appreciate the opportunity to give perspective and that's all That's all I ask as a historian. You know, I'm not here rewriting history or trying to tell another person's story. It's just, we're just telling a different story of the same event, same place, same time. And that's what makes good history is all these different stories coming together and it's complicated, it's painful at times, but it's the truth. And I feel like we can't shy away from that. We have to you know, know it and embrace it. And like you said, move on and try to figure out, you know, next steps for, for healing and for understanding. But I really feel you can't understand a person or their population if you don't know their history. And somebody could come to me and say, Eric, man, you're, you're just so anti-Christian. I'm like, I'm not anti-Christian. I'm pro Dawa. I'm not, I just don't believe in that way. And I, I don't say yay or nay to it. It's just, I'm more into this. And my way is not your way, but we coexist. I have many Catholic friends. I have you know, many people who go to church and we coexist because we see each other as humans and we just have a different way of you know, expressing our humanity. And that's what makes life good, right? It's the differences. That's right. Well, thank you, Eric, for joining us.